of gold, 50 royal hairdressers, and he only had his favorite wives. He would move across Africa and marry so many of his people into each nation through which he traveled. And on his way home, he would say, we shouldn't fight each other because we are now relatives. The grandeur of these inner West African kingdoms was far better than anything existing in the Europe of that day. When he arrived in Egypt, the writer El Amari said that he is Africa. There is nothing, there's nothing else. He came back uh, being no ordinary man, no ordinary homecoming present would be adequate for him. The army at home had conquered an entire nation and gave it to him to welcome him home. The nation was Sangye, that after his death would free themselves from the domination of Mali, consolidate all of the land mass that was Mali and former Ghana, and create one of the greatest empires in the history of the world. Because we have not measured the dimensions of African empires, and because we know so much about Napoleon's conquest, it is hard for you to conceive that African rulers, as late as the 18th century and well into the 19th century, conquered and ruled over nations larger than the total conquest of Napoleon. And the world has forgotten them almost completely. The Sangay Empire was about the size of the United States and ruled magnificently well by the uh, Sonys and ruled the last period by a great man, a commoner, known as Askew the Great, Muhammad Abubiko Ituri. Secretary of Guinea is a direct descendant of uh, this man. Finally, Europe began to stir after the Crusades. The argument between African and African had uh, weakened their hold on the Mediterranean. <laughs> Europe was so sure that it was going to emerge, that it was going to divide up the world among themselves. They began to go to the Pope to settle the argument over lines of demarcation. Prince Henry had gained control of a large number of maps made by Jewish gold dealers who had been doing business in the Western Sudan. And these maps showed the European not only how to reach inner Africa from the top, but how to maneuver down the west coast of Africa. Prince Henry opened a school where he taught the Portuguese the navigational skills that had been learned from the literature taken out of China and brought back into Europe by early European travelers to this country. Now, with this knowledge, European maritime skill began to improve. They had developed gun technology, principally to defend themselves from each other. They would partly settle their family dispute, thanks to the marriage of Isabella and Ferdinand. And European nationalism was reborn. In 1492, they expelled the last Africans from Spain, where they retreated to Granada and stayed until 1610. But Europe was now effectively rising to its feet again. But it was a different Europe. It was not the Romo-Grecian world of Europe. This Europe was racist. This Europe was bitter. This Europe was hungry. This Europe 
was insensitive to other people. It was not the Europe of Alexander who had a number of black generals in his army, <coughs> principally uh, <coughs> Cletus Nigra, who had grown up with Alexander. It was not the Europe of Rome that employed many Africans in highly technical position and let Africans govern many of the Roman colonies. It was not this Europe now. It was the Europe after the Crusades. It was the Europe after the Children's Crusade. It was a mean, hungry, insensitive Europe about to emerge as a power force in the world and about to change the world for all times to come. It would never, absolutely never be the same after the rise of this Europe. And it is a pity that this period, monumental and pivotal in the history of, the man, of man, is so poorly studied. I've seen books in when this entire period is covered in three pages of text. And most of what is said in those three pages, not even the truth. Not even the truth. Now I think once we examine Europe in the aftermath of the Crusades, and once we concede that Crusades had nothing to do with religion, but these were political Crusades, and that the acts of the Crusade was the most irreligious thing imaginable, once we look at this rise of this European at this period, coming out of what I call a thawed out icebox and bringing a temperament to match the temperature of an icebox and moving out into warm climates with people who always had enough to eat, enough to wear, and enough land. And this cruel personality, moving only slightly out of feudalism, having no sentimental attachment to each other, let alone the rest of the world, would begin the slave trade, would begin Western racism, and would change the world for all times to come. The European period of exploration was well underway. They were down the coast of West Africa. Christopher Columbus had visited West Africa one time, at least one time. And I mention one time because I have the documents on this, before his new world exploration. Finally, one of the great queens of Europe, and I'm not going to go too extensively into this, because besides Elizabeth I of England and Isabella, I don't rate European queens very high. I don't rate European female power brokers very high for no other reason other than the fact that besides Elizabeth and um, Isabella, few of them had any massive power. They were rather decorations. And people at this point say that what happened to Catherine the Great and why isn't Catherine the Great included in all of this? She's not included in all of this when I look at the female great women of Europe because in my estimation, she wasn't great. And she wasn't that effective in, um, in Russia. And she spent so much time with her personal fights with men and seduction and destruction that she really wasn't an effective power broker. And I don't see what good she did for Russia, but that's a matter of opinion. And I'm sure you have other opinions, but that's not what I'm trying to get at. What I'm trying to get at is that with the beginning of the slave trade, it did not get underway until the opening up of the so-called New World. And had there been no market for the slave, there would have been no slave trade. And the market was created by the destruction of Indian labor that made it a necessity for <coughs> the increase <coughs> in African labor sanctioned by the church after they had been petitioned by Bartholomew 
D. Les Casas. And I don't know why this man, a monumental figure in the business, has been so forgotten. Some people want to assess him as a hero, and some want to make him a villain. He may not have been either one. He may have been a man reacting to a tragic circumstance of history. When he saw the Indians dying wholesale from exploitation and European social diseases, he petitioned the Pope to increase the African slave trade as a replacement for the Indians with the hope that he could save some of the Indians still alive. By the time the Pope sent uh, a commission to look into the genocide and the rapid death of, an Indian, of the Indians, many islands in the West Indies had no Indians left. Now, the power in the, of European control, the thrust of European occupation in the West Indies and the whole of the so-called New World needs to be looked at, and it needs to be looked at from the point of view of the victim, not from the point of view of those who benefited by this occupation. From the victim's point of view, Christopher Columbus is a villain because Christopher Columbus first suggested get the African to replace the, uh, the Indians. But nobody paid that much attention to him. He wasn't a man with that much statue in Rome. But when Bishop Bartholomew Las Casas went to Rome and pleaded for the increase in the African slave trade to replace the Indian labor, the Pope listened and the Pope sanctioned it. And the slave trade got well underway after this period. Before Las Casas died, he regretted the role that he had played. He had not saved the Indians, and he had um, increased the African slave trade to the point where the Africans were now manning plantations in South America and in the West Indies. Slavery was somewhat different in Brazil and other parts of South, Af South America, principally because large numbers of black women married uh, Portuguese men after the church sanctioned these marriage, and none of these black women would marry a Portuguese man and stay a slave. She would not only demand freedom for herself, but many times demand freedom for the people who came over on the boat with her. Large numbers of slave revolts began to develop as early as 1522, the first recorded slave revolt in Cuba. And because these Africans could maintain their cultural continuity, maintain their language, maintain their drums, they could communicate with each other much better than those in the United States who were sold in small lots and resold a lot until mama went one way, papa went another way, cousin went another way, and none of the culture that they had brought over with them could be easily identifiable. While in large areas of the West Indies and in South America, they would buy an entire boatload of slaves, and they would put them all on one plantation. They could maintain their cultural continuity, and this Cultural continuity was the mainstay of uh, the successful revolts in Jamaica and in Haiti, where they had the most successful uh, revolt. Now, what I've been trying to get at, some of the main currents in the history of the world that led to the present period that I call the period of the black and beautiful plateau, where we are demanding a reassessment of world history 
especially as it relates uh, to ourselves. I began with a reference to the TV series Roots. And I began it in this way because it introduced a subject that none of us wanted to talk about and wanted to talk about because we were schizophrenic on the issue. We did and we didn't. And now it has introduced it in such a way, in spite of the technical errors, in spite of the errors in interpretation of African culture in both the book and uh, in the, um, and the TV presentation. Not even an elevator operator or a porter or a train conductor, nobody can ever again say they didn't know what was happening. And one of the great myths that fell was the myth of the good slave master. There was no good slave master. Good people don't enslave people, period. <laughs> and people kept wondering, why in all of this, where is the decent white person who's going to be shown? Decent white people were not involved in the slave trade. The slave trade was developed by the overboiling, the slimy human scum of Europe. And there's no use being pretty about it. No person of character and morality could have dealt in this kind of business. And in spite of few exceptions I take, and I'll point them out and conclude, to some of the things in both the book and in the uh, television presentation, it was more good than bad, and ultimately will have long range benefits. And maybe now some people will read other books on the life of African people before and after the slave trade. <coughs> they will read the massive documents on African resistance to slavery. They might read Herbert Aptecker's work written over 20 years ago on American Negro slave revolts. They might go back now and read W.E.B. Du Bois' The Suppression of the Slave Trade to the United States, or a comparative recent book by John Blassingame on the slave community. They might read Gutman's work on the slave family, on, on, on the family, and Frazier on the family in general. Now in the first part of the television series, when the boy goes through the ceremony of manhood that was uh, correct in its execution in many ways with a few errors, he comes home, then he tells his mother, women, men don't let women tell them what to do. In that culture, he would have no more said that than we, he would have grown wings and fly because that is a matrilineal society. And Western sociology has misinterpreted matrilineal societies entirely. It does not mean female domination. It means the lineage comes down through the female line. And the female comes to power when it is her time to come to power, and no one can rule her out of it. She don't come to power just because she's female. She comes to power when in the logical sequence of things, it is her time to come to power. And her right to power is protected by the society itself. Unlike a patrilineal society where the woman cannot come to power at all. In a matrilineal society, the king's son can never be king. The king's sister's son can be king. And you'll find in patrilineal societies that has royalty, there's always plots between the father and the son. Because the son thinks the father is living too long, and he will never come to power. And so he wants to hurry father along 
so that he can have his turn. <laughs> in a matrilineal society, there's no point of hurrying farther along because you're not going to be king uh, anyway. Not only the boy would not have said this, but after coming home from the ceremony of manhood, it said that your father has built you a hut. Fathers don't build the huts. The community build the hut. The boy is the specific son of that father, but he is the collective son of that community. And that community looks after him, and that community expects him, now a man, to look after them. And that community expects him, soon after he comes home from the ceremony, to look around and spot someone to be his wife and to take up the responsibility of a married man and a father in uh, that community. In one of the segments, I think was the third, John Amos playing uh, Kente, grown up, mentioned the Wolof people. He is Mendinki. And he mentions the Wolof people as having a personality different from the Mendinkis. And what the writers forget is that the Wolofs, the Bambaras, the Malinkis, Madinkis are all the same family, all Mende speaking people whose overall cultural name is Mending. The word Mendingo is merely a Western corruption of Mending. And they are not that different in culture and um, in temperament. Not enough was said early in the book and in the film about how Islam came to the Senegambia area and how long Islam had been in that area and that Islam, while it did not create the culture in that area, altered itself to accommodate these cultures. But it did bring a language that was good for recording, good for accounting, and good for the structure of institutions. Now what we are doing now in an awkward way in our spiritual trek back to Africa, looking for a definition of ourselves, looking for our history, basically, our roots, trying to redefine ourselves, trying to find out where we have been so we will know where we have to go. We are seeking a new definition of our relationship to the rest of humankind. And we have, in our struggle for our heritage, sought a new definition of heritage. And I will close with this definition that is a mixture extracted from others and uh, composed partly by myself. Heritage, in essence, is how a people have used their talent to create a history that gives them memories that they can respect and use to command the respect of other people. The ultimate purpose of heritage and heritage teaching is to use a people's talent to develop an awareness and a pride in themselves so that they can become a better instrument for living together with other people. This sense of identity is the stimulation for all our people's creative and honest efforts. A people's relationship to their heritage is the same as the relationship of a child to its mother. Thank you.
Dr. Clark is available for about 10 minutes worth of questions. At the end of that time, there will be a reception, a reception at the BCC on Welsh Street. So if you have further questions after this uh, brief question and answer period, uh, you can meet him there for some personal contact. Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. Yes. Uh, the Zimbabwe ruin, ruins in what is now called Rhodesia, whose proper name is Zimbabwe, were discovered uh, or rediscovered. Uh, the Europeans are always discovering things that other people knew about long before. But uh, an American was one of the first people to stumble upon this ruins, then an Englishman named Bent, then it was researched. And when the British, when the British saw these magnificent structures, uh, castles and buildings and temples, they assumed that uh, they were created by an Asian people. And they went to Asia and they, they found no architecture any place in Asia resembling it. They had one investigation after another dealing with the cultures of Zimbabwe and the civilization. Finally, an English woman who had nothing to lose and did not feel like catering to eat anybody put the nonsense to rest, said this is a Bantu civilization and it dates to about the fifth century. Now other people have dated it much earlier than that. That was Gertrude Caton Thomas and her work on the subject is considered to be a minor classic in research called Great Zimbabwe, or the Zimbabwe uh, culture. A man named R. N. Hall has written another excellent account on it, and a man named Randall McEva, who was killed in a plane crash with Dag Hammershaw, has also written a, another uh, work on the Zimbabwe culture. There's no lack of information. There's a popular article on it appeared in um, the magazine Horizon last year, establishing the fact that this is a, a distinct African culture, and it was not built by any outsiders, but built by the Africans themselves. Now the assumption is that Africans have built no stone structures in the area south of the so-called uh, Sahara, but here's a perfect case of great stone structures deep into southern Africa, obviously built by and designed by the Africans themselves. But the present population who live in the area uh, said that they found these structures already there when they arrived. I mean, the Shoners and the, uh, we know that the um, um, so-called Metabellis uh, arrived rather late during the Zulu period, but the Shoners have been in that area at least a thousand years, uh, coming, I think, originally from, from the coast of, of East Africa. But this is one of the many African civilizations and cultures that can be found in large areas other than the north that we need to make assessments of. There are other cities and other cultures. I think the, um, the cultures of the uh, Bashongo people in Zaire of the Congo, also a, another forgotten uh, African culture. And they too built in, in, in the main in stone other than uh, kill dried brick. But the, there's no limit to where we can go. Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. I'm sorry, but these days, <laughs> with the hair, yes, I'm, I'm you, yes, yes. Okay. Uh, yes.
I think I understand the question. And I, I, I appreciate the Okay, I, I understand you. I understand you. All right, now, I think the struggle in Southern Africa is the last struggle for the independence of Africa, and it is going to be the most difficult. <coughs> it's going to be the most difficult because the largest concentration of white people in Africa are in Southern Africa, mainly South Africa. I think um, in Zimbabwe, it might be a little less difficult than um, in South Africa itself. In Zimbabwe, I think it was a mistake for the African leaders to go to Geneva, to go at all. People with political wisdom or political knowledge or knowledge of who they're dealing with never leave their home to negotiate for their freedom with the thief who took it away. The Africans had no business in Geneva at all. Why Geneva? What's wrong with the Organization of African Unity? You mean it, it's out of business? And why this letting America take over the function of the United Nations, if it had to be some whites at all, it should have been certain agencies of the United Nations with input from all of the nations in the United Nations, and that would include more non-European than European. At what point does America have a right to take over the prerogatives of all international organization and under Kitchener's suggestions or instructions embark upon a course for the settlement of a Southern African uh, affair totally independent of other nations. Now, Ian Smith, the present Prime Minister, and Roy Walensky, revolutionists, sit down and talk with such people. Check your powder and see how the field is supplied and where your men are deployed. You go to the field if you're ready to go to the field. And if you're not ready to go to the field, you postpone the encounter until you are ready. And running can be as revolutionary as attacking, depending on what you have to do and how you have to buy time until you're ready to attack. Young people don't understand that. They think revolution is just attack and attack and advance. Revolution can be a little strategic timing, too, to buy the time when you can stop Tommy. But I think the strategy of the Africans in Rhodesia or uh, Zimbabwe was poor. And um, I think sitting down to talk to Aaron Smith was a trap because there's no talking way out of it. South Africa is a different situation and a more difficult situation. America has over $2 billion invested in South Africa. And by no stretch of the imagination will the capitalist world permit all that gold and all those diamonds and all that manganese and all that coal to fall into the hands of Africans. They intend to hold on to South Africa at any cost. And America intends to help them, help them do it. And if I have a good brother, and I weep for what is ahead of him, and the young, thank that he can change all of this with his goodness, he is dreaming. He is dreaming. I think it was disaster for him to take that job. We don't need a black person justifying America's foreign policy at this juncture in history. It was a trap, and the good Baptist got him into it, being born again. I don't know whether to take offense as a Baptist or take offense as a nationalist. I'd rather take offense as an African nationalist and a Pan-Africanist. But there's a lot of trouble ahead. I don't see any easy out. I surely don't see any talking out, and I don't see any non-military out. And it is 
unfortunate. But there's something fortunate about a lot of unfortunate things. The African will have to learn what the uh, Africans in the Portuguese area seem to learn. And once they learned it, they applied it. Freedom is something you take with your own hands. It's never left with you in a will. And each generation must secure their freedom anew for themselves. But you take it with your own hands. You don't bargain for it. You don't cry for it. You don't beg for it. You take it with your own hands. Yes, sir. Okay. Yes, sir. Arabic. Oh, that's easily documented. Um, when Islam spread from North Africa, it made its first uh, southward thrust into the area called the Senegamia. That was southern Mauritania. All of what is now the Gambia, all of what is now Senegal. And they formed a black Islamic empire called the Susus, and that's uh, well documented. And the fact that Islam, when, once it came down there, began an extensive educational program teaching its converts to read and write Arabic, that is also well documented. Idi Aman is good and bad depending on what part of the day you look or talk about Idi Aman. He is not as bad, he never was as bad as the white press painted him out to be. He has done a lot of good things and a lot of bad things. But among the good things Idi Aman has done, he has said to people living in his house, you obey the rules of my house or you get out. And the African has nearly always been betrayed by the guest in his house. The Asian invaders were guests in Africa 50 years before they went back home and got the soldiers. The Greeks were guests in several Greek colonies scattered throughout Africa and Western Asia before those same Greeks went back and joined the army of Alexander and invaded Africa. The Portuguese were guests along the coast of West Africa before 50 years later they started the slave trade. The African has a kind of a naivete tend to run through his history without never asking the guests, who are you loyal to? Idi Amman in his wild and unpolitical and accidental and unpredictable sort of a way have established the fact that he is the ruler of Uganda, and that whosoever comes into Uganda will recognize that fact or go out of Uganda in a hurry or be buried in Uganda. <laughs> yes, ma'am, I think someone has to I think the African impact on today's world <laughs> is <clears throat> more commercial than people care to admit. First, most of the precious metals in the world coming out of Africa, and you know about chrome, but there are so many other metals coming out of Africa that's not talked about. The high degree of manganese, the uh, high grade ore, iron ore from uh, Liberia, uh, cobalt, of the 10 main ingredients or substances that went into the atomic bomb, seven came out of Africa. Africa has the greatest source of um, bauxite in the world. And Gabon alone has one of the largest bauxite deposits in the world. Africa is endlessly rich. Its people are poor because other people are managing its wealth. In many of these rich African countries, the income of the African is less than $300 a year. 
I'm talking about people with families. I see the impact of Africa on the world of the immediate tomorrow as a nation moving towards socialism and moving towards socialism without being part of the Moscow camp or the Peking camp, but moving independent of both of them without being the enemy of either one and also without being the referee in the fights between the, the two of them. I think rapidly the African is understanding that there's no contradiction between socialism, pan-Africanism, and nationalism. There can be an effective wedding between the, uh, the three for the betterment of Africa. And I think they're going back and looking at old values in order to create a new society. And the best thing that can be said about Africa is that the Africans have no designs on one inch of anybody else's territory. And that's a good, healthy thing for the world. I say America not only can help Africa along the way, but benefit by it. America, who seemed to be fear of socialism, could actually, to her own benefit, America can help nations become socialists. They're going to become whether America helps them or not. And I see it has an, a major impact because there's so much there that the world needs, especially the uh, industrial world. I think we're going to have to taper off, but I'll try to answer quickly. Oh, no, I'm going to, in my own writing, uh, we, oh, it, whether I was going to make some of corrections in the, in the book Roots as pertaining to African culture. I said, it's not my prerogative to make correction in another author's work, <coughs> but it is my responsibility when I am writing to get that part of African culture straight. I'm on sabbatical writing a basic textbook on the subject with major emphasis on the culture as well as the history. I, I think this lady had a hand up then and we're going to have to stop. Uh -huh. Democracy don't mean very much to me in the Western sense and, and uh, there's none that I would classify as democracy as you define it over here, I mean two-party system, et cetera, uh, uh, et cetera. But I don't think uh, um, Tanzania is, can be read out. I mean, it has as much democracy as the, as the United States, and there are quite a few nations in Africa that has as much democracy, as much freedom of speech, and freedom of assembly and, as the United States, and less bigotry. But I'm not hung up with uh, democracy, and I'm not... Uh, uh, so much in disagreement with dictatorships so long as the right thing is being dictated. Uh, most people are for dictatorships when things are being dictated in their favor. So I'm not so hung up with I got to have a democracy or got to have a two-party system. Democracy can exist within the context of a one-party system. It has before and, um, and, and will again. And when you study the structure of these African societies before they were literally destroyed by the Europeans, you find out they had not only a no-party system, but a, a, a no-party system. And yet they had a consulted democracy where the most common person in that country could communicate with his king and could get with other people and remove a king. And there are plenty of evidence that, it's, um, that it can be done or, or was done. It's just that I don't have that much respect for the Western interpretation of the word democracy or Christianity. And when you ask me, are they democracy, or are they Christian in that sense, I'm, I'm just not moved, you know, because I don't even care whether they are, and I hope they're not. I think we're going to have to end right now. <laughs>